This Fizzcast is going to examine an example of using the first law of thermodynamics to analyse a cyclic process. Pause the video and read the question carefully. Now that you've read the question, you can see that we know the initial state, or at least some information about the initial state of our gas, and then we have these three processes that the gas goes through. And if you read carefully, you'll be able to see that the starting condition and the final condition are the same. That's what we mean by going through a cyclic process. It begins and ends in the same thermodynamic state. Let's start by interpreting how we might understand the question that's being asked. We're being asked how much heat is flowing during the cyclic process. Well, we know we've got an ideal gas, so we know that we can relate our pressure, our volume, and our temperature using the ideal gas law, PV equals nRT. An equally useful way of thinking of this is that provided the amount of gas doesn't change, that is, the number of moles remains constant, then the pressure multiplied by the volume divided by the temperature must be the same no matter what state the gas is in. So PV divided by T must be constant. Remember we said this was a cyclic process and that has a very important consequence in terms of the first law of thermodynamics. It tells us that the change in the internal energy throughout the entire cycle must in fact be zero. Because we're starting and finishing in the same state, it will have the same internal energy at the beginning and the end of this process. So that tells us here that Q plus W, which is what the first law tells us the change in internal energy must be, is going to be equal to zero. Or therefore we could write that the heat that flows into the gas, remember that's what Q is telling us, must equal the negative of the work. And remember, the work in the first law of thermodynamics is the work done on the gas. Now let's move to the development stage of our solution. It's very often useful to have a diagram at this point, and for this kind of problem, a pressure versus volume graph is going to be very helpful indeed. So if we have our pressure here on the vertical axis, and we can do that for the moment in units of atmospheres, because that's what our problem was given in, and let's have the volume along the horizontal axis, and we'll make that volume in units of cubic meters. Now before we start to draw what's going on, it's useful to think about where a good starting point. In this problem we can see that from our initial state, the first thing we do is we reduce the pressure, so we're going to be moving vertically downwards. The next thing we do is we reduce the volume, so we're going to be moving horizontally to the left. And then finally, we're going to be moving back to the original volume, that is back across to the right. So perhaps starting in a location like this on our graph might be a useful starting point. And let's label that as state A. That's our initial state there. So the first step is the pressure is reduced at constant volume. So that means we're going to have a vertical line going down here. Well, let's pop some numbers on so we can make sure we're doing roughly the right thing. Remember, we started off here at 0 0.06 cubic meters, and our initial pressure was three atmospheres there. And we're going to come down to a pressure of two atmospheres. In this first step, we're going to come at constant volume down to what we might call state B. Let's put an arrow on there because it's important in one of these diagrams that we know what direction we're moving from state to state. Now the next step is to go at constant temperature until we get back to the original pressure. So we're going to want to be somewhere along here at the same pressure as state A, but we're going to travel from B up to that pressure at constant temperature. Now what can we tell from that? We can look at this expression just here for our ideal gas equation. We can see that if our temperature is constant, then our pressure times volume has to remain constant. So we have to move somehow back to our original uh, pressure whilst pressure times volume being constant. And if you think about that, it tells you immediately the line you're going to have to follow here is going to have to be the shape of a hyperbola. Something like that, moving to a state here that has the same pressure as our initial state. Let's call that state C, and we're moving along in that direction there. It might be useful to try to determine what the volume of state C is going to be. The question hasn't actually told us that, but again we can use this condition of pressure times volume divided by temperature being constant. Again, all the way along this line from B to C, we know we have the same temperature. That means the pressure times the volume at each point along here must be the same. So the pressure times the volume at point B is 2 
times 0 0.06. Let's not worry too much about our units for the moment. As long as we keep our units consistent, we should be fine. The combination at C of pressure times volume must be the same. So 3 multiplied by what volume must be the same as 2 multiplied by 0 0.06. And that's fairly easy to see that this thing here must be 0 0.04 cubic meters. So we now know what the volume at state C must be. The final step in this cyclic process says our gas expands at constant pressure. That means we're not moving vertically at all, so we're going to have a horizontal line that takes us back to the original volume, that is, back to our original state A. And there on our PV diagram we can see we have the indication of where we're going around from A to B to C back to A. From A to B is isovolumetric, from B to C is isothermal, and from C to A is isobaric. Now, how does any of this help us answer the question of what's the heat that's going to flow? Well, the first law tells us if we could calculate the work that's being done, then the negative of that will be the heat that is going to flow. And we know from our PV diagram that the useful relationship is the work that is done is equal to the negative, the integral of pressure with respect to volume. And importantly, that's the work that's done on the gas. That, of course, is going to tell us the area under a pressure versus volume curve. And we have all that information here, so we should be able to calculate the work for each of these stages of the process and therefore calculate the total heat. In our evaluation step of our solution, we can do that one step at a time, so let's begin by thinking about the work done in going from state A to state B. Remember, it's going to be the integral of PdV, the area under the curve. Well, the line that goes from A to B where volume doesn't change, that has no area at all under it. So in fact, the work going from A to B will be zero. That's in fact always the case. There's no work done if there's no change in volume. And going from A to B, there was no change in volume. The next one, what about going from B to C? What's the work done when we go from B to C? Again, that's an isothermal process, and we have a reasonably straightforward relationship for the work done in an isothermal process. It's minus NRT multiplied by the log of the final volume, that will be the volume at C, divided by the initial volume. And for us, that will be the volume at B. Now this looks a little problematic at the moment because we don't seem to have been given the amount of gas, the number of moles, or the temperature. So how could we use this expression here to calculate the work going from B to C if we don't have enough information to calculate N times R times T? And the way to do this is again to come back to our ideal gas equation here where we see that N times R times T is nothing more than the pressure times the volume. So I can in fact rewrite this expression here as minus a pressure times a volume times the log of the ratio of these volumes. Of course what pressure and what volume do I need to put here? Well because the line from B to C is an isotherm every point along there has the same temperature. So NRT will have the same value all the way along. So I could take the pressure at any point multiplied by the volume at that same point, and I would have the, the quantity NRT. The simpler one here to use, I might just take the pressure at B and the volume at B. They're ones that I know quite easily. They were given to me in the question. So this will be minus, the pressure here is at state B uh, is two atmospheres, but we're going to want to do this in SI units. So we'll need to convert atmospheres to pascals and one atmosphere is 101.3 kilopascals, so two atmospheres will be two lots of that. Uh, we also need to multiply by our volume at state B, that's 0 0.06 cubic meters, and then we'll have to multiply that by the log of the volume at C, which is 0 0.04 divided by the volume at B, which is 0 0.06. And then when I put that into my calculator, I get a number that comes out to be 4.9 kilojoules, 10 to the 3 joules. Importantly, when I do that calculation, it comes out to be positive, that quantity. You can actually see that's going to be the case because you can see there's a minus sign out the front of this expression for the work done, and here I'm taking the log of a number that's less than 1. When I take the log of a number less than 1, I'm going to get a negative, and so a negative times a negative, I'm going to get a positive quantity. Another check I can do is what's going on as I go from B to C the gas is being compressed. To compress a gas, 
the container or the surroundings of the gas must be pushing the gas inwards. So there's a force pushing inwards as the gas moves inwards. Well, that's a force and a displacement change in the same direction, and that means I'll do positive work. So that actually seems to be the correct sign. The final one to calculate here is the work done as we go from C to A. Going from C to A, an isobaric process, the pressure doesn't change. Again, the work is going to be in the area under that line. Well, the area under that line is quite easy. It's, it's a rectangular area under there. Um, the pressure doesn't change, so in fact the pressure can come out the front of that integral. It's simply going to be minus the pressure multiplied by the change in volume. So we can calculate that. The pressure is 3 atmospheres, and again we'll need to convert that to pascals to keep our answer in SI units. And what's our volume change here? Well, it's our final minus our initial, 0 0.06 minus 0 0.04. And when I do that calculation, I wind up with a number there of 6.1 times 10 to the 3 joules. And it's got a negative sign out the front there. My change in volume was positive, so the work done on the gas was negative. Putting all this together, we can now calculate the work that's done during this closed cycle. It's simply going to be the sum of the work from A to B, the work from B to C, and the work from C to A. So the first one of those was 0, the second one of those was plus 4.9, and the last one of those was minus 6.1, and they were all in units of 10 to the 3 joules. And when I do that calculation, I find I get a number there of minus 1.2 times 10 to the 3 joules. That's the net work done during that cycle. Remember the question was asking me how much heat was flowing. So that allows me to calculate that the Q is going to equal the negative of that. That's what the first law tells me up here. So that's going to be plus 1.2 by 10 to the 3 joules. That's now my final answer. The positive sign is important. The positive sign is telling me that the heat is indeed flowing in.